And everybody said, The Lord bless everyone in Jesus' name. And the grace of the Lord will be abundant in every life, in every family. In the work of our hand, we'll prosper in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for our leaders, our pastors, our overseers, and all our workers who are here tonight from every section of the work. Lord, we thank you for the grace you've given us already. Thank you for the strength that your people are not tired coming. And we pray, Lord, every weariness or tiredness, you will wash away and cleanse away, drive away from every life in Jesus' name. Grant us the joy of service excitement and zeal and enthusiasm in serving you in jesus name and we pray lord that this work will prosper in our hands and you will reward everyone appropriately in jesus name once again train your people tonight develop your people tonight and move us forward in the understanding of your word confirm your blessings upon every life in Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. You can see now we're coming to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. We're looking at verse 14. In Titus chapter 2 verse 14 it says, Who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works as we know that all scripture is given by inspiration inspiration of God by the spirit of God and is profitable for doctrine for reproof for correction and for instruction in righteousness that the man of God the child of God the minister of God the leaders in the church everyone in the church will be perfected matured made complete so that will be thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And we know that each statement, each sentence, each chapter is actually pregnant with great meaning and wants to deliver into our lives what we should have so that we will understand more, we'll dig deep more, and then we'll prosper in the work of the Lord. We're looking at this verse today. And we're looking at the full redemption that comes to us through Christ, who is our sufficiency. The topic tonight, full redemption through Christ, our sufficiency. You'll find here the redemption. And you'll find it is full. And you'll find there is nothing to add. There's nothing to subtract. Look at what it says. Who gave himself. The last two words of verse 13 says, Jesus Christ, a Savior. And then it comes to verse 14, that Savior, that Christ, that one who died for us on the cross of Calvary, was the one that gave himself for us. Why? For what purpose or what reason? So that he will redeem us from all iniquity and from all the consequences of our sin. And then will purify unto himself a peculiar people, a special people, a called out people, a unique people, a distinguished people. And those people, by the virtue of the grace of God that comes to them, they'll be zealous, they'll be enthusiastic, they'll be excited, there'll be the fire, the zeal, the enthusiasm within them that moves them only to good works that means there'll be a performance there'll be nobody that will be barren spiritually nobody that will be fruitless spiritually nobody that will be inactive inoperative incapacitated that you cannot do anything will be zealous of good works go over that again he gave himself for us that means he gave himself for each of us he gave himself for all of us. He gave himself for everyone, in every generation, in all generations. And that tells us then that Christ's sacrifice is for you and is for me. 
Christ's substitution is for you and is for me. Christ's atonement. When Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, it wasn't for this section of people or just a group of people for everyone at that time and everyone that will ever be born it says that that atonement covers everyone every sinner it means that christ's suffering was for you christ's suffering was for me the suffering you should have urged if you were to die the way you are it says Christ took all the suffering, all the penalty, and all the punishment of your sin. Everything was laid on him who gave himself for us. It's saying that the propitiation that is for the Lord Jesus Christ to so atone for our sins that God will say, that person I cannot see any reason to punish him anymore because all the sins are atoned for and it's the propitiation for everyone it means the redemption for everyone for each one and for all when it says he gave himself that means he fully gave himself there wasn't any part of his life you've learned about jesus the son of god is the perfect one is the sinless one is the spotless one is the blameless one all the purity of eternity that he had he gave himself so that no matter how far you have gone no matter how deep you have gone in sin or anybody the purity of christ the holiness of christ the personality of christ and all that christ had he gave himself completely without any reservation and he did that for you he did that for me he did that for all he did it for the worst of sinners in any generation pick up somebody today that you have heard about that you have read about pick up somebody today that you know about the worst in every community jesus christ gave himself for the worst of sinners in any generation in every generation that covers you even if you were to be the first sin the worst sinner in the whole world he gave himself for you he gave himself for me and he bore the full wrath of heaven the fullness of the indignation of God the fullness of the wrath of God that should come upon the sinner because of his sin Jesus bore everything he's taking the penalty away he's taking the suffering away he's taking everything away that you should have suffered look at that verse who gave himself we understand for us for me for you for everyone that then he says that he might redeem he might redeem what does that mean you see that word redemption is that the now is the ransom that means that we were in the slave market. And because we were in the slave market, under the dominion of sin, the dominion of Satan, and the dominion of everything that had come as a result of the fall of Adam and Eve, now he came to buy us back, take us back, and release us from every pressure coming from sin and coming from Satan. For redemption is now available. I say for redemption is now available. Salvation is available. Righteousness is available. Freedom to be totally free from sin and all the consequences of sin. That's part of the redemption. Not only that, victory. Any temptation that comes, any trial that comes, any difficulty, any challenge that comes, is come to give us victory. And then in this, is come to also solve the problem of the original sin the depravity, the carnality, the original sin that we got from Adam is taking that which is because he came to redeem us from all iniquity. Iniquity in the original. Iniquity in the practice. Now, if Adam had done such a terrible work, 
that Christ could not reverse. It will mean that the sin of Adam was greater than the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. But there is nothing that Adam had done. There's nothing that Adam had deposited in us. The depravity, the originality of sin, and the very root of sin that the sacrifice of Jesus could not settle. That's why it says is that he might redeem us from all iniquity and then to purify. To purify. Uh, you know, sometimes when you've got a piece of cloth and it's a dirty and uh, you go, you give it for washing. They can wash it very well, but they cannot bring it to the original stage in which that um, in which that clothes was. The same thing when you have maybe a machinery, a car or whatever it is, machine, and so you've used it for some time uh, and something has gone wrong, and you could take it back to the mechanic. They can repair it. It will look very nice and sound very well and serve you very well, but they cannot return it to the original in when they bought it. But in the case of Jesus Christ, when he says to purify unto himself, it means that you bring yourself to the Lord. And the original purity that the Almighty God created when he said, let us make man in our image, our after our likeness, so that they will have dominion over all things. You take this heart back to Jesus Christ. He's the only one that can so purify, that can so sanctify, that can so cleanse, that can so set you free and get you back to the original. I'm getting back the original. I said, I'm getting back the original. He said that he will purify unto himself. He says, when he purifies you like that, you're too good for the world. You're too good for any other person to touch you, use you, and then take hold of you and say, now you are good. You're good enough for my company. You're good enough for my family. No, you are so purified that you are not, you are, you are you have gone beyond all the companies of the world and that if that is the only place you are you are living an underprivileged life but he has purified unto himself he says these are the kind of instrument i will use and he polished you for that he cleansed you for that he purged you for that so that he'll purify unto himself a peculiar people. What does that mean? It means as you look at the workers who are there in that company, you look at the workers who are there in this uh, in this firm, you look at the workers and the leaders who are there in politics, you look at the leaders and the ministers who are there in any other section of work in the world. And when you come out, when the angels look at you, when God looks at you, when you look at yourself, it says this one is peculiar. There is no comparison. When Christ takes hold of you and Christ cleanses your life and purges your life and he says now you are unto him, a peculiar person. It means that no matter who you are compared with, when we compare you because of the grace that now comes, because of the power that now comes, a peculiar people, then it says zealous of God was this is a fire that burns at the altar of your heart without any kind of a human, natural, carnal effort. It is burning continually. It's like the fire at the altar of uh, the sacrifice of the children of Israel that it says it must burn continually. It's not like, um, you know, somebody is up now, then it's now tomorrow. Somebody is zealous now, then it's uh, cold uh, tomorrow. Somebody is, uh, you know, on fire now, and then you cannot find anything about him later. It says this one is because of the sin that Christ has done, because of the redemption he has given, and it says a peculiar people's Zealous of, tell me, good works. You look at him, everything he does, like Jesus Christ went about doing good. Here is a replica. Here is a representative. Here is somebody that comes out of the hand of Jesus. Here is a product of divine grace. Here is a product of Calvary. Here is a new covenant person. And now he also he goes about doing good. I see people doing good here. Everywhere you go, goodness will follow you. Everywhere you go, you will do good in Jesus' name. That's the verse we're looking at today who gave himself for us. That he might redeem us from all iniquity. 
and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. As I said, the topic is full redemption through Christ, our sufficiency. It will do something for you tonight beyond everything you ever got in Jesus' name. I know you've been blessed before, but he's going to bless you more. I know he has cleansed you before, he will cleanse you more. I know he has purified you before, he will purify you more. You're going to come as a product out of the hand of the almighty God. And even the devil will be jealous of your service in Jesus' name. Three points we're looking at. Number one, the purposeful provision of Christ our Savior. The purposeful provision of Christ our Savior is provided this for us. And there's a purpose for that. And that's why we're looking at what he has provided and the purpose of that. Point number two, the peculiar purity of Christ-centered saints. The peculiar purity of Christ-centered saints. And point number three, the passionate pursuit, the passionate pursuit of consecrated soul winners. The passionate pursuit of consecrated soul winners. We're coming to number one, the purposeful provision of Christ our Savior. We're coming to this uh, chapter 2 of Titus and in verse 14, who gave himself for us who gave himself for us, he made a provision. And it says he gave himself for us. What's the purpose of that? What's the reason for that? Why will Christ, the Son of God, why will Christ, the perfect one, why will Christ, the sinless one, why will Christ, the spotless one, why will Christ, the master of angels and men, why will Christ, the one that says, I and my Father are one, why will he give himself for you? Hey, look at uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 6. 1 Timothy chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 6. It says in verse 6, Who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. He said he gave himself. How and why? As a ransom. As a sacrifice. As the price to be paid because of the sins we have committed. And so we see the purpose of that. He gave himself a ransom. We're looking at uh, Galatians chapter 1 and we're looking at verse 4. Who gave himself? Who gave himself? He gave himself. In Galatians chapter 1 verse 4. Who gave himself for our sins? If we didn't have any sin, he'll not give himself. But our sinners and because of our sins because of our guilt and because of the punishment that shall come and because of the pollution in us so that he will set us free from our sins it says he gave himself for our sins that he might do what tell me out loud that he might deliver us from this present evil world that's the purpose that the purpose if i am delivered I will not be under the pressure. I'll not be under the problem. I'll not be under the yoke of this present evil world. Look at the world around you. If you're coming from the village, what have you heard about the evil in this present world? If you're coming from riverine areas, what have you heard about the evils in this present world? If you're living in the city and you have heard about the various things that are happening, what have you heard about the evil of this present world? If you are familiar with you know, something happening in the night and in darkness and whatever in those societies, what have you heard about the evil of this present world? Christ gave himself for the purpose of delivering us from the evil of this present world. Do you know you are delivered? Every evil power will crumble before you. Because you see, it is done already. And if we don't know why he gave himself for us, uh, many of us might still be wondering here and there, something is touching me from tonight, they cannot touch you again. Something is pressing me down, they cannot press you down anymore. And they say that my problems are greater than my power. I pray, I fast, I do everything, but what can I do? These people are so strong, 
they are part of the evil of this present world. And it says, he gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God. God our Father. You know sometimes somebody is uh, going through some challenges and then he's saying I don't know. Well I know this is evil. I know this is a real pressure. I know this is a real problem but I don't know whether it is the will of God for me to be free from this or not. Look at this. Look at this. He says according to the will of God our Father you are delivered in Jesus name. Uh, we're looking at uh, Galatians chapter 2, Galatians chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse 20. It says, I am crucified with Christ. You see, uh, here it's not, it's not saying, maybe I will, maybe I will not. It's saying, it has happened already. For me, it has happened. I said, for me, it has happened. Uh, look up here, look up here. When the people, those Jewish people, when they crucified Jesus Christ, they stopped everything, every other thing they wanted to do. Well, when you lead a person to the point of crucifixion, no matter how angry you are, no matter how powerful you are, you've gone to the final point. Even those two thieves that were crucified, one on this side and one on this side, after they crucified them, all the enemies went back. All the past chasing them went back. When you get to the point where you are crucified with Christ, they have done whatever can be done, they will all go back. They will not follow you anymore. And here Paul, the apostle said, and he's saying it for me, and he's saying it for you, I am crucified with Christ. Did you say that? Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Look at where we're going. Then it says, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me. And what did he do? And gave himself for me. What's the purpose? When we read in Titus chapter 2, who gave himself for us. What's the purpose? He gave himself for you so that you can identify with him on the cross. He gave himself for you so that you can identify with the very fact that it is not you living now. It transfers his power into your life. His divine energy into your life. It transfers his divine strength into you. And it says the life that I now live. Because he gave himself for me, the life life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Thank God he loves me. Thank God he loves you. And because of that, he gave himself for you. You see, that's the purpose. He gave himself. Hey, look at uh, Ephesians chapter 5, uh, verse 25. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. We're looking at the purpose, the reason for which he gave himself. It tells us in verse 25, uh, husbands love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. Tell me and gave himself for the church. You see that? He has given himself. And what's the purpose of giving himself? You know, if we're not better than the other people for whom Jesus has not died, then we don't understand the meaning of giving himself. But he gave himself in verse 26 that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Every time I read the word of God, it will be like water washing me. Every time you hear the word of God, it will be like water washing you. All the dirt and all the whatever it is. So you know, you've gone to the office and you come back and they say something, they do something, you see something and it makes your heart less and strong and all that you come here tonight. The word of God will wash everything away in Jesus' name. You go back to the original. And then your original strength, you recover. Your original purity, you recover. Your original power, you recover. Because the word is coming to you and cleansing you that he might present it to himself a glorious church. And a glorious church is made of glorious Christians and glorious preachers and glorious ministers. Every one of us, you will be glorious. In your heart, in your mind, in your perspective, in your understanding, in your relationship with the Lord. He says it makes us a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. And you know what he said? Come back to Titus, Titus chapter 2. 
I'm reading here from verse 14. In Titus chapter 2 verse 14, he says, Who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us. That he might redeem us from all iniquity. It was the expectation of the Jewish people. They looked at all their sacrifices. They looked at everything they did. And they saw that the sin was still there. Well, they were forgiven. And their sins were covered. Then the following year they come in the day of atonement. And they were sacrificed again. But they still felt the presence of sin. They still felt the pollution of sin. They still felt the power of sin. And so it was the expectation, where will it be? That the, the final sacrifice will be taken. The final sacrifice will be offered. Because we offer it now. We have to come again. We offer it now. We have to come again. And it's because we have not been redeemed from all iniquity. Look at their expectation in um, Psalm, Psalm 130. Psalm 130. What they were looking forward to. That one day it will happen. One day it will happen. Look at uh, Psalm 130. And I'm reading from verse 8. It says, He shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. And when that happens, there'll be no need for sacrifices anymore because now it is done. And that time came when Jesus was about to come. And then we're told in Luke chapter 1, Luke chapter 1, reading from verse 68. Luke chapter 1, verse 68. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. They are getting near now because they have been envisaging, they have been expecting, and they have been praying. When will it be that he shall redeem Israel from all their iniquities? And then he goes on in verse 69. And he has raised up an horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which has been since the world began, that we shall be saved from our enemies. You'll be saved. And from the hand of all that hate us. From the hand of all that hate us. Now you can imagine the children of Israel. You know they came out of the Philistines. Then the Assyrians came. They overcame the Assyrians. And then the Babylonians came. They, they overcame the Babylonians. And the, the Greeks, the Persians came. They overcame that. And then the Romans came. And they said when will all this end? That we'll stop fighting and fighting and fighting battles. They knew it, was, it would be at the time when their redemption will come and they, look, they went back to read the Psalms he shall redeem us from all our iniquities when shall it be when shall it be and thank God now Christ comes and it has been I said Christ comes and it has been look at verse look at verse 73 the oath which is swear to our father Abraham that he will grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear. That was a great revelation to those Jewish people because he was always afraid, always afraid, always afraid. But now the time will come when the final sacrifice will be done. The time will come when somebody Christ, the Lamb of God, will give himself for all our sins and he will redeem us from all iniquity and then will serve him without fear. Look at verse 75. In uh, holiness and in uh, righteousness before him, the Almighty God, all the days of our life. Thank God Christ has come. And Christ has redeemed us now. And because of that redemption, that means now we are free. No more fear. I said no more fear. No more night uh, palpitation. You know, my heart is beating. I cannot sleep. You are healed from all that in Jesus' name. Galatians, Galatians chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 13. Galatians chapter 3. And we're reading from verse 13. Christ has paid the price now. Who gave himself? For us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity. Look at this. Christ in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13. Christ has redeemed who? 
us from the curse of the law. Be made a curse for us, for it is written. Curse it is everyone that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. The way is now clear. The curse is taken out of the way. And blessing is flowing into our lives. The purpose for which he gave himself, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity. And thank God you are redeemed. Look at Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, reading from verse 12. You need to praise God. I say you need to thank God. Look at what he's done for you. In Colossians chapter 1 verse 12, giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet, fit, suitable, to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who has delivered us, can you make that personal? Who has delivered me from the power of darkness and has translated me into the kingdom of his dear son. Think about that. He has translated you out of the kingdom of darkness and has translated you into the kingdom of his dear son. In verse 14, in whom we have, do we have? I said, do we have? Who has it? You have it in Jesus' name. Never will anything bring you into bondage. Bondage to Satan, God forbid. Bondage to sin, God forbid. Bondage to society, God forbid. Any power that be anywhere, bondage anywhere, God cancels that in your life in Jesus' name. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. As you come back to Titus chapter 2, we're looking at verse 14, Titus chapter 2, and we're reading here from verse 14. It says, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity. Redeem us from all iniquity. In Romans chapter 6, Romans chapter 6, reading from verse 18. This is freedom. I said this is freedom. When Christ takes hold of you and then he makes the provision of Calvary to be effective in your life, thank God you are free. I said, thank God you are free from all iniquity. Look at this in Romans chapter 6 verse 18. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. Look at verse 22. But now, be made free from sin and become servants to God. Ye have your fruit unto holiness. At the end, everlasting life, you will be a fruit. When Christ lives inside you, and when Christ fulfills the purpose for which he called you, you cannot say, I cannot bear fruit. My community is so sinful. My community is so dirty. My community is this and that. You'll be the white lily growing out of the muddy community and there'll be no part of that mud, of that dirt upon that lily by grace in Jesus' name. The grace of God comes to you and then it cleanses you and forgives you and sets you free. And you are so free that you are totally free. Look at chapter 8 and verse 2. It says, For the law of the spirit of life in Christ has made me free from the law of sin and death. Somebody there is free. Look at First John, First John chapter 3, First John chapter 3, and I'm reading from verse 5. It says in First John chapter 3 verse 5, And we know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Thank God that is me. My name is there. That's my privilege. That's my inheritance. 
He says, whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth has not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous. Even as he is righteous, he that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. You look at your life. Apart from, you know, you live above sin, you're going to live above sickness. You're going to live above all the activities of evil spirits. Anything that is a work of the devil is cancelled from your life in Jesus' name. Verse 9, whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Now, you see something here. Because he gave himself for us, the consequence is we now give ourselves back to him. Look at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, reading from verse 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, reading from verse 5. He's giving himself for you, and then you reciprocate, and you give yourself fully, completely, entirely back to him. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 5. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. Yeah, you belong to the Lord. You are fully given unto the Lord and nothing will take you away from the kingdom and from his hand in Jesus name. Point number two, the peculiar purity of Christ centered says, the peculiar purity of Christ centered says, we're coming to Titus chapter 2. I read from verse 14. Who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity. Look at this. And purify unto himself a peculiar people. And purify unto himself a peculiar people. The first thing we're looking at there is the purifying of the believer. You are saved. You are born again. You are converted already. And then you go back. You say, I know Calvary has something more for me. He has forgiven me. There's still something more. He has saved me. There is still something more. He has pardoned me. And there's still something more. And so I go with the peace of God in my heart. I'm now asking for the purity of heart. That's uh, why it says he purifies unto himself. Again, the children of Israel were looking forward to that. They were looking for the time when their hearts will be purified. They were looking for the time, expecting the time when there will be so much purification. There will be no guilt. They will serve the Lord without any distraction. Malachi chapter 3. In Malachi chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 3. Initial siege, it was to be future for them, and it is still future for many of them. Initial siege as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. You see, the children of Israel they were looking for the time when Christ will purify those Levites who were serving at the altar, and it will so purify them there'll be no guilt, there'll be no offense, there'll be nothing at all. Then they'll be able to offer to the Lord in righteousness. Look at verse 4. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. That was their expectation and eventually Christ came and Christ came for you and he came for me and now as we go to the Lord for the second touch 
For the second cleansing, he purifies us. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 15. I'm reading from verse 9. Acts chapter 15, verse 9. It says, And he put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. He pardoned us by faith, the salvation. Now, he purifies the heart by faith, the sanctification. He pardoned us by faith, that's conversion. And now, he, he comes to purify the heart by faith, that is the circumcision of heart. It is the second work of grace. First John chapter 1. First John chapter 1, we're reading from verse 7. In 1 John chapter 1, reading from verse 7, look at what he said, but if we walk in the light, those are believers, those are Christians, those are people that are already saved, if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and look at this now, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, what does he do? cleanses us from all sin. Uh, that's that uh, second work of grace and it is the full redemption that Christ has uh, provided for us. Look at uh, Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9, reading from verse 13. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 13, for if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies to the purifying of the flesh how much more how much more he said put all the sacrifices of the old testament together and and look at the greatest saint that ever lived in the old testament dispensation and then see what the blood of bulls and the blood of animals have done and then come now to the new covenant if the blood of animals could do that in the old covenant how much more shall the blood of christ who through the eternal spirit that's the holy spirit eternal offered himself without spot to god purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living god and so you see we have been saved and now he comes to sanctify us and to purify us and he makes us unto himself uh, come back to this titus we need to underline this and underscore this it tells us in titus chapter 3 verse 14 who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify now unto himself unto himself you see what he does he says i want to make use of him but i need an instrument as good as the original man i need an instrument as good as the original woman and so he first of all brings you and the way you are maybe you are thinking god can never use me look at the look at my condition look at the way i am and the lord says that's why i called you that's why i brought you near i'm going to so cleanse you that when god himself my father when he looks at you he will see the image of the almighty in your life and then you'll be too good for the world. You'll be too good for any other assignment. I'm going to redeem you and purify you unto myself. Unto myself. Hey, look at uh, Psalm 4. Psalm 4. We're looking at uh, verse 3. Psalm 4 verse 3. When you become holy, when you become godly, and when the Lord does this kind of work in you, he does it so that you will be unto himself. We're looking at Psalm 4 verse 3. It says, but no, no, that the Lord has set apart him that is godly for himself. If you are saved and sanctified, he has set apart him that he has purified, him that he has sanctified, he purifies them unto himself. He sets apart him that is godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call unto him. He will hear your prayer. I come to come to Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14. And we're reading from verse 7 and reading from verse 8. Romans chapter 14, verses 7 and 8. In Romans chapter 14, verse 7, for none of us liveth unto himself, and no man dies to himself. For whether we live, 
we live unto the Lord. Or whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live therefore or die, we are the Lord. So we become his property because he redeemed us and he purified us unto himself. That's what we're told in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, reading from verse 14. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14. It says, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then were all dead, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. You see what he has done? He purifies us. He said, I'm doing this for myself because I want to make an instrument out of you, a tool out of you, a minister out of you. You will serve God in righteousness. You'll serve God in purity. There'll be no distraction at all. You're too good for, you know, the companies of the world. You are going to your place of work just to make end meet. That's not the end of your life. Am I right? Yeah. That's not the very center of your life. You're going there so that you can keep a soul and body together. So you can, you know, have accommodation, have clothing, and have food. And after that, you know that really your number one reason for existence is that you are to serve the Lord. Am I talking to somebody there? And you know, some people, they think, uh, you know, I've gone to my place of work in the morning, in the afternoon. This uh, Tuesday leadership development, maybe I'll go, maybe I will not go. This is the number one. This is the priority. And this is the very thing for which you are living. The other one is extracurricular activity. The other one is so that you can just be able to find something. And the Lord has said he will bless the work of your hand. So that your food will not uh, be wanting in your family. And so that, uh, you know, paying school fees will not be lacking in your family. That's why he allows you to go there. But the real thing, the real reason why you are living is to live for God. Is to serve the Lord. Is to do the work of God because he has reserved those who are purified, those who are sanctified, and those who are made holy. He has reserved them unto himself. Thank God I belong totally to the Lord. Without any part of you, you know, being left for the devil to use, Satan has no 1%, he has no 0.1% 0 .1 in your life to use in Jesus' name. All for Jesus, all for Christ, all for our Redeemer, all for the one that has cleansed you. And now you bring everything to the Lord, you will serve the Lord in Jesus' name. Uh, we're coming back to Titus. Titus now, chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse 14. Who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, and purify unto himself what kind of people? I said, what kind of people? A peculiar people. Look up here for a moment, you know. God wanted to do this for Israel, but they disappointed God. He wanted to make them a, a kind, the crown of creation, the crown of humanity. He wanted to make them special, wanted to make them unique. He wanted to be able to point to them in the presence of the angels and say, look at them. Look at what grace can do. Look at them. Look at what the power of God could do. Look at them. Look at the peculiarity and the uniqueness of the people. And look at what God had in mind. But God, the disappointed God, I will not disappoint God. We're looking at Exodus, Exodus chapter 19. Exodus chapter 19, I'm reading from verse 5. Exodus chapter 19, and we're reading from verse 5. It says in verse 5, Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me, above all people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. That was the expectation of the Lord, that they will be peculiar and there will be nobody like them. That's what peculiar means, special. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6. Deuteronomy chapter 7, reading here from verse 6. It says in verse 6, For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God has chosen thee to be a special people 
unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. That was the intention of God. They'll be unique. They'll be distinct. They'll be distinguished. And they'll be special. They'll be peculiar unto me. Deuteronomy chapter 14. I'm reading from verse 2. Deuteronomy chapter 14. We're reading here from verse 2. It tells us here the intention of God. For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. And the Lord has chosen thee to be a peculiar people unto himself above all the nations that are upon the earth. But you see, they disappointed God until Christ came and those people that should be peculiar, they didn't, they didn't accept him. He came unto his own and his own received him not, but as many as received him to them, he gave power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And now Christ has to concentrate on us, most of us Gentiles, and then make us peculiar. They disappointed the Lord, you will not disappoint the Lord. Can you be peculiar? I say, can you be peculiar? You know, sometimes uh, we feel ashamed uh, for being peculiar. And uh, you know, other people in your family, they say, well, you're always in church. You're always for Bible study. Always for revival. Always for Sunday worship. When are you going to have something for uh, you're peculiar in this family? I thank you. Thank you for using that word. That's exactly what my goal is. That's what my aim is. I want to remain peculiar. I said I want to remain peculiar. You know, your place of work, they're signing in for, you know, overtime. And they said, you know, when you serve overtime, one hour, this is what you get. Uh, two hours, this is what you get. And you know, this week alone, Monday I did overtime, Tuesday I did overtime. And then, I'm, you know, I still intend to do overtime for the rest of the week. And I'm actually going to get more money that's almost equal to my salary out of the overtime. And then you see them, and then at the dot of the point where you should close, you close, and you're checking out. And then already you took your Bible from the house and uh, you're bringing your Bible out and everything they say where are you going you never do over time this one they are paying you is this one enough i'm telling you what they are paying you god will stretch what they pay you and it will stretch it it will go beyond even the end of the month in jesus name and those people who are doing over time they will not be able even to do as much as you are doing with what you have because you are coming to the house of god and you're serving the lord you are going to be peculiar I said you are going to be peculiar. And that's exactly what the Lord wanted. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 9. It says, But she a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, an holy nation, a peculiar people. That's what Christ has now come to do. Because he saved us, because he sanctified us, because he pardoned us, because he purified us, because we were converted, and because we were circumcised, he says now we are peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And that's what the Lord has done in raising up, giving us peculiar purity as Christ centered says we come to point number three now the passionate pursuit of consecrated soul winners passionate pursuit of consecrated soul winners in titus chapter 2 verse 14 titus chapter 2 verse 14 who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people. Tell me the rest. Zealous of good works. Zealous of good works. Uh, the Lord does not, after all he has done, think about it. He left his glory above. He came to this world because of you. And then all over in the world, he walked all those dusty streets of Jerusalem, Nazareth, and Capernaum. And then eventually went to die for you on the cross of Calvary. And he said, my father, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he did that just because of you. After he has paid the whole price, after he gave himself, after he has cleansed you, after he has forgiven you, after he has gone to prepare a place for you in heaven, after he has purified you, and after he has made you a peculiar person not to be cold not to be lukewarm not to sit back not to be retarded 
Now to be a seed, you have never visited Calvary. To look as if the hand of God has never touched you, God forbid. I said God forbid. Because he did this, all that he did for you, so that you'll be zealous of good works. What does that mean? Look at this, be zealous of good works. We're looking at Numbers, Numbers chapter 25. Numbers chapter 25, I read from verse 11. Numbers chapter 25, verse 11. Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, has turned my wrath away from the children of Israel while he was zealous for my sake among them. That's what God is expecting. The wrath of God is on humanity. The wrath of God is on all the sinners. The wrath of God is in, on everybody in every community. And now you, like Finney has, you are zealous for his sake. And you are telling them about salvation. You are telling them about repentance. So you can turn the wrath of God away from them. For the whole, for the whole nation too. Look at verse 13. He shall have it. That is, uh, let me read verse 12. Wherefore say, behold, I give unto him uh, my covenant of peace. And he shall have it. And his seed after him, uh, even the covenant of an everlasting priesthood. Look at this. Look Look at this because he was tell me zealous for his God because he was zealous for his God that's what God is expecting for every Israelite not only Phineas but Phineas singled himself out he said I'll be peculiar there was somebody that was committing open sin and then the children of Israel were suffering because of that and he came he stamped out that sin and you are for righteousness I said you are for holiness. Anywhere you see any sin that will degrade, any sin that will disgrace the name of the Lord, you go in there and with the sword of the Spirit, the word of God, you preach the word pungently and those sinners will repent. And the Lord will see that you are zealous. You are zealous for the Lord your God and you are zealous for his sake and he made an atonement for the children of Israel. Israel. Uh, let's look at second, uh, second Kings. I'm reading from chapter 10. Second Kings chapter 10. Uh, to be zealous for your God and to be zealous for his sake. Second Kings chapter 10. Uh, I'm reading from verse 16. And he said, come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. So he made him to ride in his chariot. That's Jehu. Calling another person, come say, come and see my zeal. What did he do? Look at verse 28. Verse 28, it says, And Jehu destroyed Baal out of Israel. Look at our community. And look at what they are writing in the papers. Corruption here, defilement there, crime there, sin there, and all that. All of a sudden, the fire of God burns in your soul. And you say, if we can preach and touch everybody and we can have people that are genuinely repentant, people that are genuinely converted, people that are genuinely turned to the Lord and people that are genuinely washed in the blood of the Lamb. If we can have people like that in every office, people like that that will stand against corruption in every office and then every one of us will say, in my office I will stand for God. I said in your office will stand for God and then we stamp out corruption. If they bring a papers to you to sign that, you know it's not right to say, I'm going to be like Phineas. And you're zealous about it. It's not hidden. They know that that man is a pastor. That man, that woman, she's a you know, woman minister and when she's there, corruption will never pass through her table. Am I talking about you there? And then you take your stand and you are zealous for the Lord your God. Like Jehu wiped out a bear out of the land of Israel. You, by the grace of God, in your community there, you wipe away corruption. And then all the sins, uh, you know, that people are committing. And they say, well, this is a peculiar time. It's the old time. In your university, you wipe out. In your area, in that university, you wipe out that corruption. You wipe out away. All the things who cannot be mentioned that you know, that's what they are known for. That's what they are known for. It's, that's the zeal we're talking about. And as, uh, you know, you interact with other people, we're talking about people like this who are saved in every office. People who are saved in every house. That every 
every house, anywhere, we actually number the house. We say this house, there must be converted soul there. That house, there must be a converted soul there. And we're zealous for that. You will not be tired. Yeah. It will be done. Yeah. I said it will be done. Yeah. And that's what Jehu did. Look at verse look at verse 30 here. In verse 30 it says, And the Lord said unto Jehu, Because thou hast done well, you will do well. Yeah. I said you will do well. God said, Because thou hast done well in executing that which is right in mine eyes, and hast done to the house of Ahab according to all that was in mine heart. That's what you will do. The children, the children of the fourth generation shall sit on the throne of Israel. Did you say amen there? Uh, come back to Titus. Titus, we're looking at chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. And it tells us in verse 14, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous. Zealous of what? I said zealous of what? Zealous of good works. What's good work? When you make a useless life to become useful, that's a good work. When you look at members of the church and you look at, uh, you know, brothers and sisters who should be with us uh, tonight in the Tuesday leaders meeting and they're not there. And then you, you know, check up on them and they said, well, actually, they've been in the church for five years, seven years, ten years. And then they say, well, actually, uh, I, I don't know. I, I cannot, you know, bring up myself to be attending all these uh, meetings and everything. You know, the time is it's not there. And then you say, okay. Then everything you've got on Tuesday, you go to him. Already he's born again. He's sanctified. Feel what the Holy Ghost is. A committed member of the church. Only that he doesn't create the time to be in a meeting like this. Everything that you have learned here, I pass the fire back to you. Yeah. And then you take this fire from here. You sit down with him. He doesn't have time to come here. You have time to go to him. And then you as a sister to a sister, you go through everything. Brother to brother, you go through everything. And he feel, he's feeling the warmth now. The fire is burning inside him. And then you pray together. Next Saturday, you check up on that same person. You will not let him go. I said you will not let him go. And you check up, were you there at uh, Saturday workers meeting? Actually, I should have been there. But you know, uh, as I was preparing to come like this, you know, something happened again that I um, thought about something that, you know, kept me down. Uh, you will not, uh, you know, chastise after all. It's not under you. It's like an adult, a colleague like you are. You sit down with him. Everything you heard that Saturday, you go through everything again. And then the fire will be burning next time he himself will come. He'll go to our leaders. He'll say, now I have time. And when you do that, you're doing good work. Good work. You see, there are people who have been coming to the church and they're backsliding. And so they're not even regular in the services anymore. And nobody notices them. In a large church, they are lost in the crowd. And then you say, I've not been seeing sister so-and-so. I've not been seeing brother so-and-so. And then by the time you get to them, they're already discouraged. And they're saying, actually, well, I don't know what's happening to me. In fact, it's not just coming to church alone. This has happened and this has happened. I don't know. I'm going to, you know, put the pieces of my life to together you say with God all things are possible you never say anything negative you are not going to beat them down. you are not going to bury them before they totally die even after they have died the resurrection power of the Lord will come through you to them they'll get up in Jesus name and then everything you are learning, Monday Bible study, you take everything you have learned at the Monday Bible study, that Jesus Christ is the Savior, he is the Son of God, he is the Shepherd, and you get them through everything, and then you pray together. If you are going to fast together, you fast together. That's zeal, that's zeal, that's what you are talking about. And then you are doing good works until they are restored. And then you and those people, you go to people in your community. This person is a church member somewhere, but he doesn't know Christ, He's not born again with the love of God inside you, you preach to them, you preach to that individual until they become born again. That's the good works, uh, you know, Paul the Apostle through the Holy Ghost is talking about that was zealous of good works. Uh, let, let's look at this, let's look at this. Romans chapter 16, I'm reading from verse 3. Romans chapter 16, verse 3. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers 
in Christ Jesus. That's a good work. That's a good work. The minister is there. The preacher is there. The pastor is there. And then you become a helper. You become a helper. You look for areas where this should be in the life. This should be in the ministry of the pastor and the ministry of the evangelist and the ministry of this and that. But nobody is supplying that uh, need and therefore you're becoming a helper. That's a doing good. You are zealous for that. You're always on the lookout for what can I do to make the ministry better? What can I do to make the work easier what can i do to get more souls in the kingdom look at verse 4 who are for my life laid down their own necks the security and then it says unto whom not only i give thanks but also all the churches of the gentiles likewise greet the church that is in their house likewise greet the church that is in their house that's part of the good words i have a parcel of land here come and use it i have the, you know the an empty space here come and use it and all these converts who are going to be following up and uh, you know in their houses we can do the follow-up with them there they can bring their friends together to you now you are not going to say hey, there's a television box there oh, what about that there's television also on the phone there's television also on your ipad there's television almost in every gadget now so don't talk about that now it may be in their house that you're going to do the follow-up and then they gather their friends together and you come regularly maybe every day everything you learn on Monday you take it there everything you learn on Tuesday you take it there in a simplified form everything you learn on Saturday you take it there in a simplified form everything you hear on Sunday you take it there and there'll be a church there in that house there'll be a church there in your house there'll be a church there in that apartment that's the good we're talking about and the lord is going to raise every one of us up to this so that we'll be zealous for good works in jesus name titus titus chapter 2 titus chapter 2 we're going to turn this to prayer who gave himself for me that he might redeem me from all iniquity and purify me unto himself, a peculiar person from now on from tonight, I will be zealous. I said I will be zealous. I said I will be zealous of good works. You will do good. Your ministry will impact many lives. And you will not sleep. Here is an opportunity for us. So that by the grace of God, we'll reach out and we go in the zeal of the Lord. And the zeal for the sake of the Lord and for the house of God, for the ministry of the word of God. And we are going to succeed. Satan will clear before you. Evil spirits will clear away before you. All hindrances, cobwebs, they are cleared away from your sight in Jesus' name. The power of God be in your life. The authority of the name of Jesus be strong. He will resist him in your mouth in Jesus' name. Every sickness the Lord takes away from you. And then every weakness the Lord takes away from you in Jesus' name. Rise up in the strength of the Lord. In the power of the Lord. And you tell the Lord, Oh Lord, I thank you for that provision. And I thank you for the purpose. And I thank you for what you've done. Let that fire burn within me, inside me. Let me go forth in the strength of the Lord and I will do good. You will do good. You'll be rewarded eternally for what you are going to do this week and this month and this year and for the rest of your life.